Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Book Club. Uh, lots of people showing up from all over the world, uh, from the UAE, Costa Rica, Denmark, Brazil, Greece, Arizona, Ohio, Vail, uh, Lebanon. I just love I, Pittsburgh. We go from Lebanon to exotic Pittsburgh. I love it. Texas. I just love how many people joined. Spain, hello. It's, I love how it's become a, a, a global thing for all of us. Thanks for coming back. We tried to adjust the time so that even more people could join and not have to stay up too late. So thank you for being here. India also. Um, uh, as many of you may know, we started Book Club near the beginning of COVID because we were all physically separated. And I wanted to do something where we could uh, maintain our social bonds. And the whole idea was not necessarily about reading a book, but finding an excuse to get on the phone with people, to get on Zoom with people, and to talk and talk about something that's not uh, the news or COVID or something like that. And that's why we started Book Club. It was about us doing things together. So thank you for forming your book clubs and, uh, and being a part of it. A uh, few changes this time. We're now on three platforms, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, also new, we started a book club Facebook group um, and so all book club discussion and you can watch it there and all that good stuff. So uh, if you want to join that, meet other people in the book club. Again, this is about doing things together. You can go do that. Um, I had such an amazing time. We weren't planning on doing more book clubs, to be honest. We were going to do Start With Why uh, because I had to reread the book and I figured invite other people to read it with me. Um, but I'll be honest with you. I had so much fun. And after each one, I was so inspired um, that we decided to do it again. And instead of doing the books in order, we decided to read The Infinite Game, uh, mostly because I think that the message of The Infinite Game and the lessons in The Infinite Game are so valuable and valid to everything that's going on in the world. Um, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, COVID, uh, just, just the fact that we've become more connected as a planet, I think, because we're all going through so many similar things. Um, I thought the mentality of the infinite game uh, was really important to discuss. Um, can't believe it's July already. It feels like we, we started the last book club in April, if you can believe it. Um, what else? I have my notes here. Um, I think that's everything. Uh, for future book clubs, if you want to send questions, you can always send them to book club at simonsinic.com. Obviously, we're also going to do live questions here. Okay. Let's get going. So let me give you a little history of this book. So um, it's based on a philosophy by a philosopher named James Kars. Um, somebody gave me his book many, many years ago um, called Finite and Infinite Games. And it's this wonderful little uh, kooky little book. It's this treatise um, about these two, these two types of games. Um, and it really challenged my way of thinking. Um, that we are these players in infinite games. And I realized so much of what we learn in leadership, even just how to manage our own careers, um, we're getting bad advice. Um, Everything is about winning and being number one. And I realized that's not what life is. Life is not about a finish line. Life is a journey. Life is, is not about just a series of destinations. Life is this ongoing thing. And I think one of the reasons that... Um, I discovered that one of the reasons I think we mess up leadership a little bit and sometimes create more complication in our lives is simply because of our mindset. And so I, I, be, I, I was using Dr. Carse's work and a lot of the other work that I was doing and uh, at some point realized um, I wanted to write more about how do we actually learn an infinite mindset. And that's what the infinite game is all about. I'll tell you a quick little story because I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Kars recently. He's 87 years old. He's amazing. He's sprightly. He's funny. He's engaging. Um, and uh, I asked him, of course, I had to ask him, how did you come up with the infinite game? And he was explaining to me that in the 1970s, um, game theory was all the rage. All Everybody was talking about it. And a lot of these uh, mastermind groups were formed to discuss game theory. Um, if any of you have ever heard of the prisoner's dilemma, that came out of one of these um, mastermind groups in the 1970s. And so it was like philosophers and mathematicians and economists who would join up and talk about these things. And Dr. Kars was invited. And he was astonished that all they were doing is talking about winning and losing, winning and losing. And so he raised his hand and said, what about play? Because even the prisoner's dilemma is about being the winner. Um, and so he got this idea stuck in his head about what about the play? And he went home and he started to notice patterns. And he saw his kids, when they would play ping pong, he had three sons, when they would play ping pong, there was always fighting, there was always 
paddles being slammed down, if somebody lost, there was always accusations of somebody cheating. Um, and it was always sort of a bit aggressive. Um, but when his kids were doing something creative, like Lego or drawing, um, it was quiet. People would come and go throughout the day and it would just go on and on and on. And he started to recognize the value of play rather than the value of just attempting to win and recognized that this idea of playing is actually more important than anything else. What I call an infinite mindset, he calls play. And so uh, when you start a business or go through your career um, or go through your life, um, it's about the play. It's about the joy of the game that we come and go. And sometimes things go well and sometimes they don't. We can have finite objectives, but it's this ongoing sort of uh, uh, thing. Um, and so uh, it was so wonderful to learn the origin story. Um, I thought what I would do uh, bef before I start answering questions, first of all, a couple little shout outs. Um, my folks are on here. I have to say hi to them. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Um, uh, I also have to say to, hello to the Dakota Potato Peel Pie and Literary Society. You guys have been freaking loyal from the get-go. Um, uh, so thanks for being here. Um, tell you a couple little things. Uh, I marked some chapters. Um, please post your questions in the chat um, and uh, I can get to some of those. Um, so it was fun to reread the book. Um, obviously it's not been as old, long as Start With Why, um, but it was fun to reread. Um, and there's a couple things that really stood out me that really struck me um, that I really appreciated. And it reminded me of sort of how to even approach my own career. Um, there was one, one phrase here uh, one, uh, on page 19 that says, a finite minded leader uses the company's performance to demonstrate the value of their own career. An infinite, mind an infinite minded leader uses their career to enhance the long-term value of the company. And I love this. I really love this idea of, of using performance of our company to show how good we are versus showing up every, every day to help to help the company be better, which means help the, 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 the customer get something more, help our employees go, uh, our colleagues go home feeling more fulfilled. That it's the idea of showing up with a giving mentality versus a taking mentality. And that just really struck me. The number of fancy CEOs who tell you how great they were because of how their company performed. Um, um, uh, like their company as a, as a standard they use um, to prove to prove their worth. Um, more specifically, and I'm happy to discuss this further if you like, I was really struck by some of the, the explanations of what a just cause is, especially um, the social movement that's going on now with Black Lives Matter and the social movement that is growing on how it's how it can grow, how it can succeed and be uh, uh, and and really take hold and be sticky. And I wrote about how a just cause must be these five things. It's it's like a test. It has to be for something. It has to be optimistic and affirmative. It's about where we're going, not where we're coming from. Um, it has to be inclusive, uh, open to all those who would like to contribute. So the question is, is how do we make an invitation? There can be different opinions on how we can advance a cause and the, the whole point is to get different opinions because though we can dif differ on how we think it works, the point is we all want as we want to get as many people as possible focused in the same direction. I think a great example is politics. Uh, I'll use America just because I live here. Um, uh, one of the things that I think we forget is the difference between the political parties um, uh, should be the intention is that we should agree on the founding principles of the nation, that all people are created equal, endowed with unalienable rights, amongst which include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The question is, how are we going to get there? And the political parties have different opinions about how we provide these unalienable rights to all people. That's the discussion. And that's why the parties go in and out of power, depending on the time, because Politics change and opinions change and cultures change and perspectives change. And so we may favor one strategy over another depending on the time. But the real debate should be about how we get there, not about where we're going. And I think where politics becomes destructive is where we start debating what the whole point is. That was established for us already. That's the foundation of the nation. The debate is simply how do we get there? It has to be inclusive that all people in all parties have a say. Um, 
uh, service oriented. We've talked about this one, that the primary benefit has to be others. Yes, we can reap benefit from our own careers. We can make a good living. We can uh, 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 we can have our ideas spread. That's fine. We can be, receive notoriety for our ideas. These things are fine. But the primary, the objective word here is the operative word here is primary must be for the good of others. Service, a service mentality. We are social animals. We're tribal animals. And this is how we build community. We trust each other when we trust that the people in our community actually are thinking about us and caring about us. This is why service orientation really matters. It builds trust. If we have a selfish orientation, we put ourselves at the center of the equation, we destroy trust. Um, resilience, it has to be able to endure and it has to be idealistic. And I think this is a very important thing right now, which is, um, these ideals that we have will never be perfect. We will never get it right. But the whole point of any social movement or any national experiment or any nation or any career or any life is that we're advancing further and further down a path knowing full well that we'll never get to the ideal state that we hope to one day. Um, I really love this idea, big and idealistic and unachievable. I think that's important. And to recognize that progress gets made fast and slow, and sometimes there are steps back. But the point is to continuously point forward. This is what inspires us. This is what um, motivates us to show up every day. OK, that's my little preamble. It was just I really enjoyed reading this, I have to say. It was really fun to read it again, especially given the context of the world we're living in now. To read about the just cause uh, reminded me. And it was as relevant now as it was when I wrote it. Um, Let's do some questions. Uh, okay, first question from the International Book Club. Uh, Julia and uh, Sonia, uh, uh, can a person have an infinite mindset in their private life, though act finite-minded in their business life? If so, could the main drivers to act with different mindsets in different environments? Okay, you can have an infinite mindset and a finite mindset everywhere. Um, the, the, the important thing is not to, to create, to create them as in opposition. They're not on opposite sides of a seesaw. Um, it's not, you have an infinite mindset and I have a finite mindset. That's not quite how it is. It's that the fine, the infinite mindset is the context within which the finite mind, the finite things can exist. It's not the absence of finite. It's the, it's the, the, the purpose for those finite things. So for example, it is a false belief that an infinite mindset is simply such a series of, of finite games. Win this game, win the next game, win the next game, win the next game, win the next game. A, that's tiring, and B, you never find fulfillment and you always feel like you're playing an aggressive game. In politics or business, if all it is is about get the next bonus, get the next bonus, get the next bonus, it's just, it just, it just doesn't work. And you accidentally weaken the organization. So uh, the, and I think I wrote about this, the analogy we have to think about is health, a lifestyle, right? So it's about what does it take to be healthy? You have to sleep, you have to eat well, you have to exercise, you have to maintain your personal relationships, probably a list of 30 or 40 other things. You can never do, we can never do all of these things you know, at a high level all the time. It just doesn't work that way. It's too difficult. And so we're, we're constantly trying to do it. We're constantly trying to live an, a, a healthy life. You can absolutely, we can absolutely have finite goals within that. I want to lose X amount of weight by X date, right? Totally fine. Same in business. We want to hit that goal, that number by that date. Totally fine. And if you hit that goal, you're excited and you're happy, but here's the challenge. You have to keep working out for the rest of your life. The game hasn't ended. Same in business. You hit the goal, then what? You have to do it again because there's no finish line. And what happens if you miss the goal? Nothing. Nothing happens. Like, you're still healthier now than you were when you started exercising. And you, if you keep on the path, you'll hit your goal in another month or two. Same in business. And so, yes, of course you can have finite objectives in business, just like you can have finite objectives in your own life. But the question is, what is this finite objective advancing? And so I, I'm very uncomfortable with this creating this, like I'm infinite in my personal life and finite in business, because that that's, I think, this sort of work-life imbalance craziness, which is the goals that I hit are to advance what? That's the just cause. That's what those find out objectives should be. They're waypoints along the way. Okay, that was a long answer. Good question. Well, this one actually is related from Lori. We're, from Lori McCormick? Yeah. Okay, related question from Lori McCormick. 
Have you applied the infinite mindset to other aspects of your life outside the workplace? If so, how has it benefited you? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the more I've learned about this, I've tried to embrace the infinite mindset in all aspects of my life. I've, I've, I try very hard not to distinguish between my work life and my home life. Um, it's me. The reason my friends love me is the same reason my colleagues love me. It's me. Um, and so uh, an infinite mindset means I bring the same just cause uh, to my personal life. I just look for different ways to advance it. So for example, if my just cause is to create a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe wherever they are, and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do, in my work, it's about the talks I give, the books I write, the, the, the classes that we offer on our website, the t-shirts that, we, that we, we, we offer as well, all to help advance a particular mindset. This is as much as a reminder to me as it is a message like I'm a walking billboard. And in my personal life, I do the exact same thing. Um, I wanna make sure that my friends have a safe space to call me and say, I'm struggling, I'm having a hard time. Um, and it's happened with COVID and, uh, uh, and Black Lives Matter. There's been a lot of uncomfortable, difficult conversations where people, sometimes me, have felt really vulnerable. But the, the point is, is we called each other and we talked. We didn't keep that information to ourselves. And I think that infinite mindset really helped. It also helps me manage um, difficulty. Um, things go badly. Things go wrong. I have fights with friends sometimes. I have disagreements. Professionally, things go sideways. And I have to try and remember this is a point in the journey. And the goal is to try and make decisions, good decisions and difficult decisions, and be uh, cognizant of the, the things I get wrong because I understand this, this journey is long and I'm still trying to get over there. So absolutely, um, I've tried to maintain an infinite mindset um, in my personal life and it has been really helpful. It's helped me keep much more grounded and keep things in context. Um, Maria uh, Mastro de Casa. Uh, did I get that right? Mastro de Casa, yeah. Maria Mastro de Casa. When you are playing the infinite game, are you able to authentic enough, be authentic enough to ask for help and guidance? If so, what would it look like to ask for help when you're in a position of leadership? Such a good question. Um, I think when we play with a finite mindset, um, it's actually harder to ask for help um, because we position ourselves as winners or, or, and especially when you reach a position of leadership, now we think we have to have all the answers and we have to be right. Um, if you maintain this infinite mindset that it's a journey of education and learning and that you're, that no matter what job you have, every day you're learning to do that job. If you're in customer service, every day you're learning how to deal with customer service in a better way because you may have difficult people on the other end of, of a phone or across a counter and you're learning every day how to be better at talking to people. As you reach a position of leadership every day, you're trying to be, um, a better leader. And I think one of the, the biggest things about being a great leader is having the courage to make difficult decisions, but also the courage to ask for help. Um, it's essential that leaders have peer groups, people they can call and say, I'm struggling. Um, it's one of the most important things to me. I have a group of friends, um, it's informal, people I love and care about, and every now and then we will call each other and ask for help. And here's the amazing thing that I learned, that it only took one of us to do it first until the other one did it. And so I had these friendships where we all sort of had all the answers and we all had our opinions and then we all had our big egos and all of this stuff and our big personalities. And I remember one time I called a, a good friend of mine and said, I'm struggling. I said, I need your advice. And from that point on, he always calls me and says, I'm struggling, I need your advice. And I think this is wonderful. It only, to be the leader, we call you leader, not because you're in charge. We call you leader because you went first. And so the willingness to be vulnerable and the willingness to ask for help is one of the factors that makes you a leader and creates an environment in which others will do the same. Great question. Here's a good one from Nina Myers. Nina Myers, hi Nina. What is the best way to teach someone else to think with an infinite mindset, especially in a way they won't get defensive? What is the best way to teach an infinite mindset to someone, especially in a way that they won't get defensive? Um, I think if we're, so the word teach is where I'm getting hung up on, right? Um, I like the word share. I like the word introduce. I like the word invite. Um, and uh, someone will get defensive, not necessarily because what we're trying to share with them 
more likely people get defensive because of the manner in which we share it with them. So for example, if we think that they're too finite driven and we decide we want to teach them about infinite, they're probably going to get defensive because they think we're attacking the way in which they do things. And we might be. Um, and so um, what I'm a great believer in is talking about my experience, which is I want to share something that has helped me a great deal. It's called the infinite game and has profoundly changed the way I see the world. And then I simply talk about what the theory is. This is the great thing about Dr. Carse's work, the definition of finite infinite games. You can explain in 30 seconds and people understand it and you can see people's wheels start turning. And then I relate it to myself. And I realized that when I was waking up every day to like beat the competition or be number one, I realized this is why it was causing me so much stress and sometimes even hurting my relationships or, or hurting innovation, whatever it is. And then since I've embraced this infinite mindset, I realized how helpful it was. Anyway, I just wanted to share how this has helped me. And it's not an imposition. So I have found that the way to get people to hear is to not talk about them because that we don't know what how they're feeling or what what place they're in in their lives, even though we're well-intentioned, they may take it the wrong way and get defensive. I find it's a great way to talk about me when introducing new ideas to people I think um, would appreciate them. Also, I believe in talking to people who want to hear what I have to say. Um, people always ask me, who do you talk to? And I'm like, whoever wants to listen. If somebody's resistant, I just move on. Remember, I we talked about this in, in, the, in the Start With Why book club, was I'm, I'm a devotee to the law of diffusion of innovations. And I really try not to waste too much breath with people on the right side of the law of diffusion because it's a hell of a lot of effort for very little gain. And rather, I want to at least talk to people who are open. They may not agree, but they're at least open to an idea that's different to theirs. So um, don't force anyone. Uh, let's see. Lisa Erickson, as I think of myself in my career, how can I have an infinite mindset when it feels like to be successful, I need to focus on the finite mindset? Oh, boy, you nailed it. How would you suggest adopting an infinite mindset for an individual contributor role? Okay, this is one of the challenges. This is one of the reasons I wrote this book, which is so many of us, dare I say most of us, are going to work in environments at companies that, quite frankly, they're only playing the finite game. And all of the incentives, all of the pressures, all of the instructions we're getting are finite, 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 finite. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we'd be the leaders we wish we had. And though we can't change the incentive structures of the organization, and though we can't change the reward structures in how our, uh, uh, um, our leaders may recognize us and, and tell us good work, um, we can change um, how we show up for everybody else, and we can, and we can start to con recontextualize our own work, which is I'm going to use my job to learn how to be a better leader. I'm gonna learn to take care of the people around me. And I'm going to talk about how their work benefits the people around them. In other words, you treat your team, whether you're the leader or not, whether you, I should say this, whether you're the authority or not, because you can be the leader even if you're not the authority. Um, whether you have the authority or not, you treat your little team as if you're the company. And I've seen this happen where you have these wonderful teams that end up becoming much higher performing because the team trusts each other, they care about each other, they become more innovative. A closed-minded company, a very finite-minded company, usually just leaves that team alone because their numbers are good. And if you have curiosity at the top, they're interested in why retention is better, morale is higher, performance is better, and they come over and say, what are you doing? And eventually, one of those people will get either promoted or moved out of the group to another group, and they take everything they've learned. And so to show up with an infinite mindset means I'm going to teach good leadership to the people I work with, and I'm going to serve as an example, because each of those people has the potential to be a leader somewhere else, and I'm going to fill the organization with great leaders so that in five years, 10 years, 15 years, when the people who, who have the authority now have gone and left, we will, we will take over. The infinite mindset is also about patience, which is I'm doing this for a higher calling, I'm doing this to have a positive impact, and I may not be around to see the result. That's the hard part about having an infinite mindset. Think about in terms of a social movement. All of the founders of the women's suffrage movement, all of them were dead before uh, 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 women's suffrage was passed, before we gave the vote to women, right? Think about that for a second. They devoted their lives to something that they never saw the result happen, and, and yet they died proud because they could see and feel the momentum because of the people around them that they had inspired who they knew would carry the torch once they were gone. That's what you do inside your organization. Find people that you can pass the torch onto. Um, um, ba -ba -bum. 
actually in relation to that, Daniel Restucio. Daniel Restucio, yes. Not to be morbid, but how do you maintain an infinite mindset when as humans, we are born, we live, and we die? Nobody gets out alive. <laughs> so he didn't he says he i don't mean to be bore, uh, morbid but how do you play with an infinite mindset when the reality is we're born we have a life we die we have a finite life we are finite players in the infinite game and that's the important thing to remember which is though our lives are finite life is infinite and we are part of continuums we we uh were born of parents and whether we have our own children, we definitely will have lots of friends and relationships throughout our lives, and we will have impact. And so we have a choice. Remember, there's three things we always consider. You don't get to choose the rules of the game, right? Life is an infinite game. With us or without us, born, die, life continues. Life doesn't care, right? It continues with us or without us. Um, we can choose if we want to play in the game. In this case, you don't get a choice. You're born. You're in. Unlike business, you can choose if you want to start a business or not. Um, but the third thing is, is we get to choose how we play the game. And so, yes, uh, you can absolutely play uh, uh, life, the game of life, with a finite mindset. And the way that looks is I'm going to be number one. I'm going to make every decision uh, as to what, what will pay me more, which will get me more power, which will get me more influence. I remember talking to a guy who was, it was a friend of, uh, it was the husband of my, uh, a friend of my sister's. And he was in a dark place in his career. He just lost his job and he wanted my advice. He wanted to help find the, his why. And I got on the phone with him. We started talking and I tried to find, I started asking him questions about, tell me a time in your career where you loved what you were doing. He could not think of one. He could not think of one project, one instance, one job he's ever had that he loved being a part of. And I asked him how he chose his jobs. And every single time he changed jobs, it was because of the salary that was offered to him. When he graduated college, he took the first job that offered him the highest salary. He had competing offers. The second job, he took the highest salary. The third job, he took the highest salary. He only ever took jobs that paid him more. And now he was unbelievably unhappy and had nothing to look back to, had very few relationships, had very few uh, um, loyal relationships that he could call upon because he was always selfishly directed. He had chosen to play with a finite mindset. It's a choice. It usually comes with a lot of uh, health problems as well. Creates more stress and all the other health related things that come with stress. Or we can choose to play with an infinite mindset. And what that means is we live our lives with the knowledge that we will die and we wanna leave uh, this world, our company, our families, our friends in better shape than when uh, we found them. Uh, think about that for a second, that when, when our friends and family go to our funeral, they will stand and cry and talk about that they would not be the person they are today if it weren't for having you in their lives. And so many people think about their legacies at the end of their lives when they face their own mortality. That's the problem. Only when they face their mortality do they start thinking about legacy and giving and, and giving to charity and giving it all away. Why not do that when you're 21? Why not do that when you're 18? Why not live your entire life thinking about your legacy, meaning what impact will we have in the lives of others? No one wants to be remembered for the amount of money they made. No one wants on their tombstone the last balance in their bank account or the title on their business card. We want to be remembered for the impact we had in the lives of others, devoted mother, loving father, that's how you live an infinite life, even though our lives are finite. Um, here's one from Todd, Sydney, Eric, Ron, and Sherry. Um, with our society's focus on our law enforcement officers, um, how do you see us reframing our thought process, not to blame, but to address complexity and create changes for resolution? Ah, such a good question. Um, right now, we're in a place of anger and anger has to come out. Think of it like having um, a fight with someone you love, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, a friend, right? Um, where you have a relationship, it's a sibling, right? You have a relationship where there's no getting out of this relationship. Um, and, um, and, and because there has been very bad communication for so long that all of the slights and all of the little things that, that noodled and needed us in these relationships, it happens at work sometimes too. We constantly, somebody's always cutting us off in a meeting. Somebody's constantly interrupting us. And eventually one day we just start 
we just lose it. We slam our hand on the desk and we say, will you just stop interrupting me? And there's a fight and there's anger. And then all it takes is one person, either party, to listen and try to understand where the anger is coming from. And then there's a dialogue. And then both parties start listening. And then you usually end up hugging and being grateful. And though you don't want to go through that experience again, you are grateful that it happened because it forced each party to listen and try to understand the position of the other. And those friendships, friendships and marriages that have, have been able to navigate stress together and learn to listen and hear each other are way stronger as a result. Our society is going through the same thing. We have to allow for the letting of the anger. You can't, when somebody slams their, fi their fist on the table, the, the worst thing we can do is say, that's not gonna help. There's, there's a process to this. And, and, and what it takes now is for people to, to start to try and understand, and either party, it can come from either side, it can come from law enforcement, it can come from uh, uh, the African-American community, it can come from the general community, it can come from people who've been wrong, people who have, it doesn't matter. It can come from anywhere where somebody says, I need to understand what you go through because we will not find a solution until we find common understanding. And for one group to say, well, I'm not going first, it's their responsibility. Leadership is about the courage to go first. It doesn't matter where the courage comes from. One party just needs to go first. One of the best examples I heard um, I did a podcast with Maria Shriver, and uh, first of all, she's amazing, um, but she was telling me a story of an African-American woman who is afraid of the police, who is deathly afraid of the police, and the way she addressed her fear was she invited um, a group of police officers to come into her home to have tea and to talk. And even though she has been wronged, and even though those in her community have been wronged and suffered as a result, she was the leader. She didn't want to talk. She didn't want to tell them. She wanted to listen. This started an amazing dialogue of understanding. This is what leadership looks like in times of stress. Great question. And by the way, this has to happen. Until we start hearing each other, it, we live in a society, especially because of social media, everybody loves to talk. Social media is not a listening medium. It's a talking medium. It's about projecting and declaring and broadcasting. We even call it broadcasting. There's no mechanism to listen. Nobody's ever read a comment from somebody that posted on their feed and went, hmm, that's a good point. I think I'll change my mind. Never in the history of the world has that ever happened. We shout at each other. We talk at each other. Dialogue requires us to sit down together in person or, or over, over, over a Zoom, I guess, in this modern day, and listen and try to talk. Try to listen, I mean, try to hear. Okay. Shout out to Josh Fitt. Josh. Josh Fitt. Josh Fitt, Shout how are you? Shout out, yes. I have family members who are struggling right now as police officers protecting America. It is difficult uh, having conversations with them, but I'm inspired now more than ever to help them think with an infinite mindset. Yeah. So Josh was saying he has family who are in law enforcement. And I can tell you right now that the morale in law enforcement, as you could imagine, is very, very low. And um, uh, uh, one of the challenges we're going to have is the lower morale goes, the more disconnected. Think about it in our own jobs. What do you do when your morale is really low? You disconnect. You don't feel like doing your work. You show up and you do the minimum, um, and that won't help. Um, and so uh, um, what teaching an infinite mindset to law enforcement, I mean, I think uh, I've had some conversations with law enforcement, um, um, and one of the best things we can do first is have empathy. Hey, man, how are you? How are you doing? Right? It's not a question of right or wrong. It's not qualitative. It's not judgment. It's simply human, that there's a human being here. We're just saying, how are you? Just as we would expect... Uh, the opposite. How are you? If you have African-American friends, how are you doing? Same thing. And what that does is it allows for a safe space. It allows for a safe space to, some, to allow someone to express themselves rather than defend themselves. Because if we show up with anger and we show up with attack, guess what? They're going to dig in their heels. They're going to put up a barrier and they're going to defend, even if they disagree with their own defense. Why? Because they feel attacked. And so what we want to do is create that safe space. Teaching the infinite mindset is about infinite mindset is about creating that safe space that simply allows them to, to say whatever they want to say. We, and we hear it without judgment. We don't have to agree with it. We're just creating a space. And then when that vulnerability comes out, 
and, and I've had these conversations, then what ends up happening is these people in law enforcement say, we have a lot to do in our profession. We have to change things. We have to do things differently. And they'll start to tell you the things that can be done. And they start to become allies and helpful because they know what levers work and how the culture works a lot better than the outsiders. We're creating allies. And the way you create allies is just making people feel heard. We don't have to agree or disagree. It's just about creating a safe space to feel heard. So yes, that infinite mindset will definitely help with your family that's in law enforcement. Um, uh, okay, Rodney uh, Kurihara, how do you play the infinite game when your company, the executive leadership, is firmly entrenched in the finite game? Um, hypothetically speaking there, Rodney. Um, also, is there a use for finite leaders? Okay, so first of all, let's call them finite minded, right? Because it's their mindset. No one is born this way, right? Um, um, and it's kind of a little bit like the question we had before, which is unfortunately our society um, glorifies the finite mindedness. We glorify the people who cut costs and, and demonstrate the bottom line is great at the expense, at the great expense of people or the longevity of the company. The average lifespan of a company in the 1950s was about 60 something years. The average lifespan now is about 18 years. I mean, that's crazy. In other words, we have done damage to our own companies because of finite mindedness. Uh, um, uh, and so it goes back to the, the answer I gave before, which is we cannot change the minds of people who are, who are more senior than us. You know, if your CEO is three or four levels above, what are you going to do? You can't change other people. No number of anonymously sent books will change their mind. Please keep trying, but it won't work. Um, and so all we can do is take responsibility for ourselves. The only thing that we can actually change is ourselves. We can't even change our own circumstances. We can only change our reaction to the circumstances around us. And I'll go back to the answer I gave some moments ago. Be the leader you wish you had. Don't worry about the boss that's finite-minded. Worry about the team that you can learn to be the great infinite-minded leader and that you can impart that same education on your team and create more leaders. One of the primary jobs of a leader is to make more leaders. And so look to the left and look to the right and say, these people, these are the ones that could be the future leaders. I'm going to be a part of the solution. These are the people that will eventually replace that person who I know is going to retire, get fired, or die. Who's going to replace them? Let's build the bench now. All the low-level and middle management folks now will eventually be the senior leaders. Let's build our bench. Be a part of building the bench. Like that women's suffrage movement. Build the bench even if you aren't there to see it happen. It's about momentum. Um, um, and the second question you asked is, is there a use for finite-minded leaders? Of course, these are not good or bad. It's, it's, it's that finite-minded uh, 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 leaders have value as long as they understand the context in which they're operating. Like, I'm, I'm so head in the clouds that if you left me to my own devices, nothing would ever get done, you know? And so I need people around me who are much more process-driven and operationally driven. And sometimes the frustration we have with each other is I'm all head in the clouds and they're like, Simon, I just need you to focus here. And I think that they're being so focused that they can't see the forest for the trees. My job is to help them see the forest for their trees. Their job is to try to see the forest for the trees so they understand the context within which all those finite choices are being made. The biggest mistake we make is when we take that finite-minded personality and we put them in a job that has to be infinite-minded and they are unwilling or cannot adapt. It's not a it's not a fait accompli that just because you were in a finite minded job, an operations job, and you're now in a in a in a visionary job, people can adapt. But it's hard if you're a senior leader, if you're 50 years old and 60 years old, and I'm going to tell you now. Oh, by the way, everything that made you successful and get to this point, by the way, you have to abandon that and learn a completely new mindset because your job is different. It's really hard to do, especially because they've been so successful with everything they've been doing. But if you're an operator and you've been moved into a visionary job, that's exactly what you have to do. So do we have need for finite-minded uh, personalities? Of course, as long as they're in partnership and understand that there's a greater context for the work that they're doing. Okay, let's take a question from over here. What do we have here? Um, uh, what books, Juan Gonzalez, how are you? Uh, what books and themes <laughs> do you have in the oven? Um, you know, I, 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 I don't want to. I, I don't do multi-book deals because I don't want to be forced to write a book. Every book I've written, I think, is the last one. To be honest with you, um, 
I will only write a book if I think I have something worth sharing. I, I will tell you, however, I am very interested in human relationships these days. I'm really interested in what makes this work and not work, why we get along and why we don't get along. Um, we're tribal animals. You've heard me say this before. Uh, many of you have heard me say this before. We have an entire section in the bookshop called self-help. We have no section in the bookshop called help others. And I'm more interested in building the help others industry than contributing to the self-help industry. Um, you know, our nation, our society has over-indexed on rugged individualism and defining things like money and 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 uh, and possessions as 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 definitions of success, and yet uh, the people who we admire and want to uh, often be more like are those who are willing to sacrifice their interests for the good of others. Um, uh, I, I I like to point out that the highest medal in our land, the the Congressional Medal of Honor, um, first of all, that this is, I have so much respect for the military. And how they and how they give the Congressional Medal of Honor. This is the highest medal in the land. We don't give it to people who, who who just had mission success. In fact, very often we give it to people who had mission failure. But every time we give the Congressional Medal of Honor, it's to to recognize someone who is willing to sacrifice their own life, whether they survived or not, so that someone else may survive. We consider that the the best thing a human being can do. And we never say they won the medal. They say that they were awarded the medal. And I love that subtle uh, 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 tip of the hat to the infinite mindset, that the medal was awarded. It was not won. It's an, I, I, I just adore that. Um, and so when you ask me what books I have in the oven, nothing specific, but I, if, I, if you force me to, to take a bet, it'll probably be something to do with human relationships. Uh, okay. Um, Here's one from, from Man United number 12. Um, hi, Simon. How do you start a small business, uh, e.g. a cafe with an infinite mindset? Can you give some examples? So, uh, the from Matt. Matt from Manchester uh, asks, how do you start a small business with an infinite mindset? Example, a small cafe. Um, okay, so the just cause that you have, and by the way, you can have your own or you can find someone else's. Uh, I think we put too much pressure on ourselves, like especially young people, because we're we're constantly asking them, what's your vision? What's your vision? Entrepreneurs are constantly asked, what's your vision? We all have to come up with a vision. Too much pressure. Not everybody's visionary. Not everybody's Steve Jobs. Only a small percentage of people have the ability to literally imagine a future that does not yet exist. We don't all have to have a vision. We do all have to find a vision that someone else could have articulated a vision that is incredibly inspiring to you, and you can take that vision and make it your own. This is what social movements are about, but it doesn't have to be uh, exclusive to social movements. When Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, that dream became a lot of people's dreams. Um, he was just one to articulate it and help us see it. And so uh, whether you have your own vision of the future or you like someone else's, um, my friend Bob Chapman, uh, when you ask him, what does your company do? He says, we make great people to do extraordinary, we build great people to do extraordinary things. He owns a manufacturing company. It has nothing to do with manufacturing. It has to do with the culture he's trying to build. He says, we measure success by how we touch the lives of the people we interact with, right? So if you're starting a cafe, sometimes your product can actually advance the cause. That's absolutely doable. Um, but maybe it's about the culture you wanna build. Maybe you wanna create an environment where you believe that every person has an opportunity and you wanna give them opportunity. So the question is, where are you hiring from? Are you hiring maybe uh, 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 ex-convicts who are struggling to, to get their feet on the ground? Are you hiring people that um, can't get a break? Or maybe your vision is about creating a place in which people feel inspired, safe, and fulfilled. In which case, what culture will you build and how will you pass that on to your customers and your employees? It doesn't necessarily have to be based on your product. It can be, ba and what you'll find is the way you show up, the way you advertise, the way you decorate the cafe, the way you um, talk to people, Cafe Gratitude, um, which is a, a, a place in California, um, uh, they're all about optimism and giving and it's sort of wonderful ooey gooey hippy dippy stuff. And uh, um, they're, they're, the names of their stuff on their menu is like something's called beautiful, something's called inspiring, something's called passionate. And the way that the, the wait staff brings you your stuff, I remember the first time it happened, I didn't really understand. And they put down my tea and they said, you are beautiful here, you know? And I was like, woo. They were telling me that I ordered a beautiful and here it was, you know, or here's your passion. 
And I just love that. These little, these little things. Was the food good? The food was fine. You know, sometimes good at sometimes it was very average. But the way that they showed up in their little cafe was made me keep going back because I just like going there. Anyway, you get the point. Um, Sarah and Nicola, the RAF girls. Um, are you RAF because you're Royal Air Force? Um, uh, we're over the moon. You're back. Well, thank you very much. I'm over the moon to be back. Um, we found our whys, but how do we find a just cause? Okay. I love that you found your why. As you know from going through that process, um, and if you've taken the Jumpstart Your Why uh, class, um, you know what it's like. It's about going backwards. Learning your why is about looking for patterns of behavior. There, is, there are consistent patterns in all of our lives when we are at our natural best, and it's about identifying those patterns so that we can be at our natural best more often. The why is about the past. Our just cause is about the future. So you say, how do we find a just cause? As I said before, have you ever tried to put into words the world you imagine? Go for a long walk, Sarah and Nicola. Go together and just talk about the world that you want to live in. Just don't worry about writing it down. You can record it if you want, I guess. But just talk about the world that you want to live in and what perfect would look like and try and come up with specific examples. Like what would a specific example of work look like? Like talk about it specifically. You know, how would someone feel? What would it look like? What you're starting to articulate is vision, right? Can you imagine it in your mind's eye? Can you see what other people cannot see? Or who are the people that inspire you? Who are the authors or the, or the, or the leaders, the politicians or the CEOs? Like there are people out there who are, who are speaking with, 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 with great clarity about the vision. And if there's someone who stands out and goes, oh, mm, I love that. I love that. Then make that cause your own. Make that cause your own. It's, it's, uh, finding doesn't have to be internal. Finding can be external. Um, but have the conversation a lot. Um, the way I was able to articulate my vision came from lots and lots of conversations. And I would pick things up from other people. I remember when I first met Bob Chapman, as I talked about a moment ago, we would talk. And Bob would use words. And I was like, that's really good. I like that. And I sort of used them to inform my own vision. Um, and there were people that inspired me that I just, I, I put pieces together. I put a jigsaw puzzle together until it formed a picture. And I was able to describe the picture that I saw. You can do the same. It doesn't have to happen immediately. It's a journey. There are, there are a lot of people asking uh, the difference between a just cause and a why. Yeah, so a lot of people are asking about the difference between a just cause and a why. Uh, again, a just cause is, uh, sorry, a why is objective and comes from the past. It is an origin story. It's where we come from. A just cause is subjective. It's about the future and where we're going. A why comes from the past. It informs our values. It informs who we are. Everybody has a why. It's our God-given right. We're born with it. And you have only one and it never changes your whole life. Your just cause is entirely up to you. You can point your life in any direction you want. You can have, even though you only have one why, because it comes from the past and it's a build, it's about building blocks. You can have multiple just causes. You can have one for church, one for home, one for career, one for work. There's probably going to be some overlap. You can have one just cause that informs everything. Um, but one's about where we came from and one's about where we're going. Think of it like a foundation of a house. A why is the foundation of the house. It never changes. It provides stability and solidity to the house. Now, what's the house you imagine building? That's your just cause. And you can bend it and change it as you go, but you have a basic sense of the shape of where you want to build it. And if the house blows down because of some uh, hurricane that comes, you can easily rebuild because you have a strong foundation and it's still going to take the same basic shape and this time it'll be even stronger. So sometimes... Stress and tragedy and uh, and disaster can actually help make us stronger. Hint, hint, we're going through COVID and Black Lives Matter. How does our society and our lives become stronger because of what we're going through? Um, we'll do a couple more questions, I think. Uh, what else? Hello from Switzerland, Steph. Um, um, what do we have here? Do, 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 do. Uh, from Anthony Henio. Anthony uh, Henio. Um, how do you help a company that has defined their just cause? Um, what, what what comes next? Now the company has found their, defined their just cause. What's next? So a company has defined their just cause. That's the world we imagine. What's next? Well, as I talked about in the Infinite Game, it's a good question because we've only read chapters one and two. Um, uh, so what comes next is the rest of the stuff. Well, now we have to ensure that we're building trusting teams, if you're the leader. Um, 
uh, we have to study our worthy rivals so that we can continue to get better and better and better and better. Um, we have to prepare for existential flexibility. Hello, COVID. Um, are we giving away all the money at the end of the year? Or are we saving some of it just in case for a rainy day? Um, and we have to have the courage to lead, which means is I'm going to build my business differently than others. Even though everybody tells me I have to be finite minded. Like there's this fallacy we tell entrepreneurs, which is they always say, pay yourself first, pay yourself first, pay yourself first. Really? Is that what, is that what the communication we want to give to our people that I'll take care of myself before I take care of all of you? Mm. That doesn't mean you have to completely sacrifice everything of yourself to take care of others. It's not martyrdom, but it's about considering the lives of others sometimes before ourselves. Sometimes that we have to make the sacrifices as leaders in order for our people to feel that they matter. This is really important. Feel, right? This is what listening is. It's making someone feel heard. Um, and these are skills. Um, and then obviously to go back to the golden circle, you can have the why and the inspiration. You gotta make sure you have the values and the, and, the, and, the, and the process to help bring your why to life. And at the end of the day, what you do, all the tangible stuff has to reflect it. That has to be a straight line. Um, okay, should we do one more? Uh, we've answered that one already. Hello, the 6040 Club. Pam Dooley, I think we answered your question. Um, Oh, I like this one. How can we train ourselves to have mindset or do a, or, or do a check if we currently act finite or, or infinite minded? There's no such thing as a perfectly infinite minded leader. There's no such thing as a perfectly infinite minded person. There's no such thing as a perfectly infinite minded organization. It is a striving. It is an ideal. Um, and um, there are times that we have to be finite minded. The, the question you have to ask is, is this a finite situation or is this an infinite situation? For example, if you have a product that needs to get shipped, if you're producing a, a podcast or you're doing something, it has to get out. It is finite. There's a beginning, middle, and an end. And then once it's done, you might have something else to do, but there's a beginning, middle, and end, which means you play by finite rules to get it done. But you have to have a concept of the infinite game. Think of it like a, like a gate agent, um, a gate crew at, a, at an airline. It's finite. There's a beginning, middle, and end. We have to get that plane off on time, and then it's done. right? But we don't want them screaming and yelling at customers just to get the plane off on time. Because that's a finite mind. It's a finite mindset, completely ignorant of the infinite mindset. We want them to be aware of the infinite mindset, which is you have to treat people right so that they will do business with us again. Because only if they do business with us again will our company survive. And so this is when sometimes you get bureaucrats, which is they hold up the rule book and say, you have to do this. It's all finite mindedness. It's all fine, but we have to have uh, we have to have a concept of the of the infinite mind. So can you train an infinite mindset? Absolutely. It's like I said before, it's about talking about it, talking about it, talking about it, sharing it, talking about it, embracing it, living it yourself, using it as a point of reference. We do this in our company now. We say, hold on guys, I think we're getting a little too finite here. And in this case, we have to be more infinite minded. And we start to think not what we're doing right now, but we start to think about the ripple effects. If I do this, what will happen? How will that affect the people? How will that affect the product? How will that? And we, we start thinking all the ripples. And sometimes we make mistakes and we pull back a little bit. But we, we, we're starting to think of ripples now. We, 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 we constantly are distinguishing between the two. Uh, should we do one more? I want to do one more. Okay. Let's do one more live question. Um, perspective is the key. Yes, it is, Oscar. Um, you know, remember, this is Viktor Frankl stuff. Um, we cannot change the world around us. All we can change is our attitude towards it. Um, uh, you know, somebody asked me, are you a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of guy? And I said, I'm a glass, I'm a glass totally full. It's half full of milk and half full of air. It's completely full. Most of the stuff in our world is about perspective. You know, I remember I showed up late to a meeting once and somebody said with a very condescending tone, you know, Simon, the early bird gets the worm. And I responded, and the early worm gets eaten. So, you know, perspective. And I think Perspective is so, so important here because when you talk about who we are and, and good and bad, it's all contextual. So I've stopped thinking about our company or even myself in terms of strengths and weaknesses, what I did right and what I did wrong. It's all context. And the story that I like to tell is I'm disorganized. I'm very, very disorganized. And you know, my mother used to make fun of me when I was little that if, if it wasn't attached, I'd forget my head. Probably right. Um, and so, you know, as a young entrepreneur, I'd started this company, I was 28 years old, and I would go to these networking events, 
And uh, I'd meet these people and they go, Simon, we have to work with you. I was a young consultant. I had this little marketing consultant. We have to work with you. And I took their business card. And any organized entrepreneur would write down the card, put it in, a, in their phone, whatever it was, and they would call the next day. They would email the next day and say, "Thanks, so great meeting you. So great meeting you. Let's 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 see if we can work together." Yahoo over here, in the span of getting the business card, would lose the business card, and then nothing would happen. And I remember this one. It happened more than once, but I remember one. Um, like two weeks later, I found a business card at the bottom of a bag, you know, covered in dust bunnies, and I was like, "Oh, probably should drop this person a note two weeks after I met them." And it turns out they wanted to work with me even more because they thought I was busy. So is it a strength or is it a weakness? It depends. It's the context. It's the context. And so perspective is everything. Everything requires context. We don't have strengths and weaknesses. It all depends on when we're doing it and where we're doing it. Um, so on that note, on the note of perspective, I want to thank everybody for coming today. So much joy. I have it. Um, what I really love and what's really inspiring for me is there's so much appetite for this infinite mindset. There's so much appetite for, for us wanting to change this mindset and learn to recognize it in our world. I think one of the things is not just about embracing it in ourselves, but learning to see it in others. A lot of questions were about what if my boss, what if my company is finite minded? Simply our ability to recognize who's playing with an infinite mindset and who's playing with a finite mindset helps us navigate, helps us be able to communicate, to speak in their language to help advance the greater good, right? Because we have to be translators rather than just simply uh, 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 teachers. So I think one of the best things about learning about these different perspectives, these different mindset, mindsets, is actually learning them to is learning to see them in other places and learn where we want to na navigate our infinite-minded lives. Um, so thank you for joining. Okay, we will be, be na we will be back next Friday, July seventeenth, same time, one p.m. Eastern, uh, for the next Infinite Game Book Club. Same places, we'll be on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and we will be covering chapters three through five. Um, so bring your questions about chapters three through five, um, and we'll talk all about them. Uh, chapter three is cause, no cause, which picks up on the just cause, on how often we get it wrong. Um, uh, the keeper of the cause, there's a responsibility of s uh, someone and a group of people to advance that cause. And then finally, I tackle the responsibility of business and take on Milton Friedman himself. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing. Next week will be a good one, uh, especially all the talk about the responsibility of business. Um, if you want to send your questions in advance, send them to bookclub at simonsinic.com. Um, if you want to rewatch anything here or refer back to it or show it to a friend who missed it, um, the recording will be available on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can see it everywhere. Um, and if you want to dive in further into these concepts and learn to adopt an infinite mindset, um, we've actually, the, my wonderful team has started to build coursework on actually how we can learn to do these things. Some people asked, how do I, how do I uh, articulate my just cause? So we have some courses that we're developing, uh, that we've developed to help you wow. do that. There are live classes. I can't stress, you know, I'm a big thing about human interaction. So there are live classes. And because I love book club, um, um, we have a 20% discount code um, for only for people in book club. So if you use the discount code uh, book club rules uh, for the whole month of July, you can get 20% off all the classes. Uh, book club rules is the discount code for 20% off. Um, uh, we have classes on how to advance a just cause, how to build trusting teams, and how to study your worthy rivals. Very excited about those. Uh, we'll be adding more um, classes as we develop them. Thank you for joining. Thank you for reading with me. Um, remember, uh, book club is not about reading a book. Book club is about doing things with each other. Find one friend, keep the group together. It's about the discussions you have before our little weekly book club meetings. Um, so take care of yourself, take care of each other, and I look forward to seeing you next week.